to the legacy of the American Revolution, a summer lecture series hosted by the Platypus Affiliated Society. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December of 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old, new, and post-political left for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. In these times, we're hosting a number of online activities, such as this lecture series and chapter-based reading groups. To find out how to join an online reading group, please go to platypus1917.org. We also publish a monthly open submission journal, The Platypus Review. The latest issue, number 128, is online now, so please check it out. If you'd like to submit an article to the review, uh, please just send an email to editor at platypus1917.org. Lastly, you can also check out our podcast, Ship Platypus Says, for your dose of the commentary on the commentary on the left, which is published regularly on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. Our most recent episode, um, on our most recent episode, the lecturers for this lecture series on the American Revolution uh, discuss the motivations for the series and why we're making the case for 1776 today and the shadow of the 1619 project. So, Please check it out, uh, share, subscribe, and give us a review. Okay, um, now to introduce our lecture series. So the recent protests against police brutality have raised questions about the revolutionary character of the United States. Platypus argues that any revolution in America for human emancipation would have to build on the legacy of 1776 and not 1619. We see the erasure of 1776 as a fundamental acquiescence to defeat. And this is why we're making the case for 1776 and the promise of liberty yet to be fulfilled. The red thread running through the lecture series is the persistence and legacy of the revolution. We ask, how does America remain a revolutionary society? How did each chapter of American history give a new impetus to the revolution that began in 1776? Our approach to the American Revolution and the subsequent history of the polity it founded is from the perspective of the bourgeois revolution and its crisis in the Marxist philosophy of history. Now, I have the great pleasure to introduce our lecturer today, Pamela Nagalis. Pamela Nagalis received her PhD in American history from New York University, where she defended her dissertation reform in the age of capital, the transatlantic roots of the American reform tradition, 1828 to 1876. She finished her dissertation as a Fulbright Fellow in Berlin, where she currently lives and works. She's a founding member of the Platypus Affiliated Society and co-host of the podcast, Shit Platypus Says. After Pamela's lecture, we'll take questions through the Q&A box and through the raise hand function. Thank you, Wantai. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, it falls to me to mark a turning point in the history of the United States that shouldn't be taken lightly. This is the reconfiguration of the American Revolution's legacy in the Jacksonian era, the birth of the Democratic Party and the rise of mass politics in the 1820s during what was called the second party system, that is the system of the Whig Party and the Democratic Party, which supplants the first party system, which Chris talked about briefly in his last lecture, that is the system of the Democratic Republican Party of Jefferson and Hamilton's Federalist Party. So what I'm asking in my lecture is how did a new generation of Americans disconnected from the original founding moment of the Republic interpret the demand for liberty, the equality, and the pursuit of happiness under the unanticipated social conditions of an emerging capitalist society? Conditions that were unforeseen by the nation's founders. So what I'm arguing is that one outcome of this is the split of the Jeffersonian tradition in antebellum America, that is the United States before the Civil War. I'd like to first build on the first three lectures of this series, um, primarily on this question of the inherited historiography of the revolution and the inherited historiography of the 19th century, which Chris has brought up in his last lecture. So both James and Chris have discussed how the perspective of the progressive historians of the late 19th century, who shunned the constitution in favor of the so-called people's revolution of 1776, 
so they counterpose these two periods. Whereas both James and Chris have considered the Constitution as a consolidation of gains made under the revolution. This tradition of historiography evolves in the 20th century in the years between Wilson and FDR with New Deal historians like Arthur Schlesinger Jr. who characterized the Jacksonian era, which is the era that I'll be talking about today, as the so-called revolt of the working masses. Okay, so there's this characterization by New Deal historians of the Jacksonian period as the revolt of the working masses. It is in this era when the Democratic Party is placed as the inheritor party of Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. But as I will show today, and as Chris mentioned in last lecture, the Democratic Party of Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren was a new organization created after the split of the 1820s. So given this initial distortion, we should be suspicious about the revisionist history altogether. And the revisionist history also includes the depiction of Hamilton as the harbinger of capitalist doctrines, inherited somehow through the Whig party and shown in their protection of the national bank. But this too is a distortion. So we have to be careful here. Hamilton is not a proto-capitalist, nor is Jefferson in any meaningful sense of the word an anti-capitalist. No, both were bound by the revolution but each had a distinct vision for the development of bourgeois society. As Chris pointed out last week, Jefferson was a federalist insofar as he supported the unity of the Republic under the constitution. And Hamilton was won over to the radicals as James pointed out, because he understood that the founding of the Republic had become absolutely necessary, right? Um, despite his reservations, he's won over. Their differences between Jefferson and Hamilton emerge under the Washington and Adams, Washington presidency and the John Adams presidency. So briefly, the agrarian idealism of Jefferson. Um, Chris called Jefferson's relationship to property Rousseauian last week, and that is insofar as Jefferson takes Locke's life, liberty and property and replaces property by the pursuit of happiness, right? So property is a means to the pursuit of happiness, but in such a way that it may not be permanent. And this is what Chris called Rousseauian. Jefferson replaces property with happiness, that is the real realization of potential, suggesting that property may not always be the means to this realization of potential. This is the Rousseauian move, according to Chris. Jefferson imagined the Republic was going to be a Republic of yeoman farmers, where each could reproduce their livelihood without depending on another for a wage. Landed property thus guaranteed the resources for the organic reproduction of the farmer's life and that of his family so that he had enough time and energy at the end of the day, as Jefferson put it, to think. So you have time, enough energy to think as a result of landed property. This call for the pursuit of happiness did remain mysterious and certainly as the conditions for the agrarian ideal deteriorated in the Jacksonian period, it became much more mysterious. On the other hand, there is the Smithian optimism of Hamilton, right after Adam Smith, the Smithian optimism of Hamilton. Hamilton thought that manufacturing and commerce would lift all citizens into potential property owners so that they could realize their potential. As Hamilton wrote in his notes on manufacturers, with enough manufacturing opportunities, all people, no matter their background, their family status, or amount of inherited land, could through their labor earn enough to realize their potential. Internal improvements and banks would lead to a growth, the division of labor and the extension of the markets and social cooperation would be the tide that lifts all boats. So that's Hamilton. Neither Jefferson nor Hamilton could have foreseen the rise of a permanent class of wage laborers. That is, neither Jefferson nor Hamilton could have anticipated the proletarianization of society. And these emerging characteristics of the proletarianization of society become evident in the United States at the end of the Jacksonian period in the 1840s. So the future of the Republic that Jefferson and Hamilton imagined did not play out, right? Neither vision 
played out in the 19th century. And as a result, their ideas were carried into the 19th century in a completely changed American society. And they were reinscribed onto new political parties in ways that the two could not have foreseen. This new generation of Americans had to deal with the problem of labor and capital as they gained a new contradictory character facing each other in civil society of the direction of wealth and value and of the proletarianization of society. Notably, Thomas Jefferson, by the end of his life, had acquiesced to the growth of manufacturing. He said, we must now place the manufacturer by the side of the agriculturalist. Experience has taught me that manufacturers are now as necessary to our independence as to our comfort. But what followed Jefferson's death was unforeseen. The decline of the artisan system, the entrenchment of Southern slaveocracy as a result of the capital needs of capital needs across the Atlantic, the credit explosion in America and the US land speculation, the rise of wage labor and workers' demands against manufacturing capital, the growth of what the Jacksonians called the moneyed aristocracy, the elite financial interests. New Americans had to deal with mass unemployment and economic crises. So to give you an example, in Philadelphia County alone, manufacturers laid off 50 to 75% of their workforces as early as 1817 to 1820, around the panic of 1819. This is an unprecedented phenomenon. In this period, you have the rise of cities as dominant centers of commerce and political power. New York displaces Virginia as the powerhouse of the 19th century. For 36 years out of the 40 years in Jacksonian America, Virginia had supplied the United States with presidents, even though New York had contributed more than a third of the revenue. So in this period, within these transformations, both this Rousseauian agrarian ideal of Jefferson's small producers republic, as well as the Hamiltonian Smithian ideal run their course. Importantly, in addition to all of this, Slavery does not come to an end, but expands and becomes more prominent in the nation's mixed economy. In the 18th century, the act prohibiting the importation of slaves was promoted by President Jefferson, who called for its enactment in his 1806 State of the Union address. He had promoted the idea since the 1770s. It was part of his push to abolish the international slave trade, which Virginia, followed by all other states, had prohibited or restricted since then. The idea was that you would do away with slave trade and you would get rid of slavery. And this too does not play out, right? South Carolina reopens its trade. You have the development of domestic, of domestic slave trade, a greater importance of, of cotton and the development of industrial capital on the world stage. So, if the Republic doesn't play out the way that Hamilton and Jefferson think that it will play out, if American society does not develop in the way that they think that it would, what kind of society does the United States become in the first half of the 19th century? What were these new emerging interests that somehow needed to be reconciled under the discipline of a new mass party? So I'm gonna spend just a little time here just describing these social changes so that we can talk about the political history and the political management of these changes. The War of 1812 had encouraged domestic manufacturing in the United States. It had opened up opportunities for industrial investment. After 1815, internal improvements, that's bridges, canals, turnpikes, roads, became the main focus for new private investment and government action both state and local. And it was critical to connecting the West to the rest of the nation, right? So all of these internal improvements were critical connecting the West to the rest of the nation and connecting the nation's mixed economy. A veritable transportation revolution stimulated American commerce as the steamboat, which had taken command in the Hudson, now commanded the Ohio and the Mississippi and the Atlantic as well. New technology was also part of this period the speed of travel per persons and freight nearly doubled. The cotton gin and the, steel plow, and the steel plow enabled farmers to specialize and to produce greater crops than before, 
right? So farming is changing, right? Land farming is transforming. Textile mills sprung up on the streams of New England as the nation developed water powered factories, including the textile factories in New England, which supplied southern planters with so called slave cottons, clothing to, um, for the masses of unfree labor in the ever growing southern plantations. And in New York, manufacturing was allowed to compete with agriculture as well as commerce for economic leadership. General Andrew Jackson's victory at New Orleans secured for commercial cultivators and planters immense tracts of land, originally obtained under the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 under Jefferson. Jefferson had doubled the territorial size of the country at this time, but it's only under Jackson in the Jacksonian era that the population of the nation doubles, right? So it does this within a sort of 20 year span. Americans by the thousands moved westward or to the cities to seek new opportunities in the expanding economy and new transportation routes encouraged capital formation and helped foster a national network of merchants, financiers, both headquartered in the regional commercial cities and capable of coordinating across the nation's mixed economy, right? So plantations, small holdings, infant manufacturers. Changes in Northeastern rural relations included the breakup of household-centered simple commodity production and push the region towards commercialized farming. So farming, being a farmer, is no longer being a yeoman farmer, right? By the 1940s, a large and growing population of the rural Northeast either switches to commercial farming or thousands of others wind up displaced in industrial cities or in burgeoning seaports. So this is a transformation of social relations in the United States. This process of urbanization, as Jefferson had once feared, included new extremes of wealth and poverty unheard of in the 1800s, reflecting new social relations with wealthy bankers and manufacturers on the one hand and poor workers on the other side. The decay of the artisan mode of production was part of this metropolitan industrialization, the bastardization of craft as part of the development of capitalism and skilled workers were slowly replaced by outwork, by cheap wage labor as well. So much so that by 1845, formal apprenticing had disappeared, right? So you'd have this system wherein the masters would train the apprentices and the journeymen, and then the journeymen would have their own shops. And in this way, this artisan mode of production preserved this kind of property ownership and continuation of mastery that Jefferson had promised. And this is falling apart. This is the moment of the development of wage labor. And it's, it's a bit of, it's a crisis, right? It's the crisis in the relationship to the, the institution of labor as such. Labor is problematized in the Jacksonian era. So these new problems um, are going to be misrecognized, both by the Whig and the Jacksonians. Uh, there's gonna be propositions about how this is the disease coming from the old world. This is a new type of aristocracy. This is a new form of tyranny that's arriving into the United States. So there's a fundamental misrecognition about the emergence of capitalist society that shapes the political conversations and the political conflicts of the period. So how do the Americans come to terms with this emergence of capital relations? So in Jacksonian America, there comes to be conflicting interests across the nation that need to be reconciled. And it's Martin Van Buren, who's the quintessential New York politician, a Democratic Republican Party member, and a key architect of the Democratic Party, which is founded in 1828, which aims to reconcile these disparate national interests through the party. Right? So he has a, a new role that the party can play. He believes in a coalition of the Southern planters and the Northern Republicans brought together and this is key in the formulation of the party for Martin Van Buren, brought together to manage society. So how does Van Buren does, do this? Van Buren forms an alliance with John C. Calhoun and a number of the other Southern politicians um, and leads the way in restructuring this political organization around the presidential candidacy of Andrew Jackson. This new organization is what is called the Democratic Party. And its leaders include Jackson, Van Buren, Calhoun, and also Thomas Hart Benton, who's gonna be a, a critical figure in the development of west, westward expansion and cheap land um, 
for, for independent farmers. But we must note here that an important reversal had taken place. While Jefferson and the majority of the founding fathers aimed to rid the nation of slavery, Van Buren and Jackson now aimed to manage the conflict and manage the conflicting interests under the discipline of a party. By combining, Van Buren wrote, the planters of the South and the plain Republicans of the North, they would prevent conflict between the slave and free states. For the next three decades and more, the Democratic Party tried desperately to keep this unwieldy alliance alive. The democracy, as the party was called, used combination, management, and party discipline to connect disaffected Northern artisans, expansionist Southern planters, Western homesteaders, and Eastern local bankers into the base of the party. Indeed, the oldest mass party in existence today, right? The Democratic Party is the first and thus the oldest democratic small d party in capitalist world history. It's the emergence, it's part of an emergence capitalist order, which is consolidated much later after the Civil War in the United States. And since the United States is the central nervous system of the global order, this is the central party of this global order, right? Um, that is to say that in the post New Deal era, for example, European social democratic parties are all building on the image of America's democratic party. So Jacksonian democracy was built on the demand to give sovereignty back to the people. What did this mean? In practice, Jacksonian Americans or Jacksonians rather extended manhood suffrage for white men in the states and created a true mass electorate. Democrats eliminated property requirements for voting and for political office. Democrats also promised greater access to land appealing to Western farmers. The Whig party and the Democratic party were divided on what to do with these Western lands, right? What to do with these territories. Democrats pushed for graduation, that is the gradual lowering of prices for these unsold lands. And this was their claim to Jeffersonianism and their battle cry was the lands belong to the people. And here they're harking back to this Jeffersonian agrarian ideal, which by the way, again, Jefferson by the end of his life, right, sees that there's an erosion already of this ideal. So he himself is changing, but they're sort of turning Jefferson's ideas in a into a sort of caricatured uh, uh, democratic battle cry. While the Whig party headed by Henry Clay planned to distribute land sale revenues. So they wanted to sell the land. They wanted to distribute these revenues to the states according to the population of these states topped up with a 10% rebate to the states where the land was actually sold. Under Clay's scheme, the money would pay for internal improvements, right? Roads, turnpikes, etc., bridges as well as education and the colonization of free black people. So these were the two, the two ideas of what to do with the land, how to make the land available to the people, how to make the revenue of the land, right? A means to pers the pursuit of happiness, right? They were divided on this issue. The call for sovereignty to the people by the Democratic Party was built on the experience of the 1824 election, which had been notoriously fixed after a four-man race, which by the way, in 1824, this four-man race, all four of them were Democratic Republicans, right? So here is the Jefferson's party pulling in different directions. There's four different candidates in the 1824 election. It's Henry Clay, William Crawford, Andrew Jackson, and John Quincy Adams the son of John Adams. In this election, there was no electoral college majority. So the choice was devolved into the United States House of Representatives. Clay was not among the three finalists, but because he was the speaker of the house, he negotiated the settlement of John Quincy Adams for president. And John Quincy Adams then placed Henry Clay as his secretary of state. So this is seen as a betrayal by Jackson and, and Martin Van Buren. Jackson had won the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, but he was not elected. So in 1828, Democrats build a party on the basis that the John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay had made a corrupt bargain. So this is, was, this was their claim. They were going to restore sovereignty to the people 
on the basis that there was this betrayal and this corrupt bargain, right? So they needed a new party. The election of John Quincy Adams splits the Democratic Republicans, Jefferson's party. And both the Whig party and the Democratic party are born from the split. So the Whig party is founded in 1833, a bit later, specifically to fight Jackson and the Democratic Party is founded in 1828. So both parties are an outcome of this, of this split of Jefferson's party. The Democrats are born with the explicit intention of electing Jackson, right? It's founded with the explicit intention of electing him. And Whigs had absorbed the ex-Democratic Republicans that opposed Jackson, as well as ex-Federalists and ex-National Republicans, which were a faction of, Jeffersonian, of the Jeffersonian party to create a common front against Jackson. So this is, this is the split that happens at the end of the 1820s. In 1826, the electoral law had finally been changed to give the choice of presidential electors to the people instead of the legislature. And Jackson ran again in 1828, and he defeats John Quincy Adams in a landslide. He's immensely popular. So the Democratic Party coalition, the new organization, is held together by a trifecta. Key players in the origins of the party are Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, and John C. Calhoun. So Andrew Jackson is a Southwesterner. He's the adopted son of Tennessee. Uh, he's originally born in the border of the Carolinas. He's, he's an officer in Tennessee who was part of the Southern governing class that went back to the days of the Northwest and Southwest ordinance in the Jay Treaty. Jackson was dedicated to the growth of the country westward, including the expansion of slavery into the new territories and providing cheap land for Western homesteaders. Jackson had been a US Army Major General. He gained his popularity as the war hero of 1812, right? So his military history is what gives him this kind of political cachet across the nation that helps unite people together behind him, even though he's a Southwesterner. He can represent something much larger. We should remember that all key political figures of this time were once removed from the battles of 1776, all except maybe for Jackson, who had been a boy soldier in the War of Revolution at the age of 13 and added to this popular cachet in his political persona. And as I said, Jackson is very popular, right? There are mass rallies in his honor, there's barbecues. The Democrats were really savvy about turning national celebrations into Jackson rallies, right? So there's a celebration of the War of 1812 and they changed the name and they call it a Jackson rally. Uh, songs were made in his honor and hickory logs were carried through the streets to honor Old Hickory as Jackson was called uh, and this is, these are the beginnings of the sort of mass electoral machinery of the Democratic Party. The second part, uh, the second uh, member of this trifecta is Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren is not talked about enough, I think, uh, just in terms of how the Democratic Party was built. He, as I mentioned, is the quintessential New York politician. Uh, and it's, it's important that it's New York because the Empire State becomes his laboratory, especially at a moment where it surpasses Virginia, as I mentioned, in its political influence and commercial clout. And here's where he develops the early machinery of the Democratic Party. He creates what is called the Albany Regency, which was a governing council in Albany, the capital of New York, consisting of a group of politically astute uh, men with reach. It was one of the first statewide political machines in the country and its success resulted from its professional use of patronage, the legislative caucus and the official party newspaper. Van Buren labored to bring about the reorganization of the party through an alliance between the planters of the South and the Republicans of the North. Unlike the founding fathers, Van Buren considered parties to be beneficial to the body politic, essential according to Van Buren, to the proper working of the democratic, of a democratic society, right? So there's another reversal here. So Van Buren thinks that the American people could more effectively express their will and take measures to ensure that their will was implemented by their representatives through the party. He says, quote, we must always have party distinctions and the old ones, he says, the old ones are the best 
Political combinations between the inhabitants of the different states are unavoidable and the most natural and beneficial to the country is that between the planters of the South and the plain Republicans of the North. John Adams, for example, in the original founding fathers, spoke for many when he declared that, quote, the division of the Republic into two great parties is to be the dreaded, is to be dreaded, excuse me, as the greatest political evil under our constitution. So it is through Martin Van Buren where the machinery of the party comes together, it's through him. The organization of the Democratic Party in its initial stages included the Central Committee, State Committees, and a national newspaper located in Washington, D.C. called the United States Telegraph. The Democratic Party included a chain of newspaper posts from New England states to Louisiana and branching off through Lexington and Western states. Supporters of Jackson were accused of trying to regulate the election, quote, by means of organized clubs in the states and organized presses everywhere which was true. Jackson's call for a rotation in office, so rotation of, of the people in office, right, replaced the merit system of appointment with what becomes known as the spoil system, right? It's this pejorative characterization of what Jackson um, is calling a democratization of, of the offices, both in, in federal level and at the local level. And what he does in practice is institutes wholesale removal, wholesale removals of federal employees down to the level of local postmasters and replaces these people with loyal supporters, right? Partisan supporters, which leads to massive corruption. Um, and so th the idea is that you're gonna take away the corruption of Clay and John Quincy Adams um, by giving the uh, sovereignty back to the people through this new system of partisan loyal uh, officers, and this creates an entirely new kind of, of corruption. And this is what it meant right under Jackson to give sovereignty back to the people. It means to give power to the party. The third and a key part of this trifecta is John C. Calhoun. So John C. Calhoun, tricky figure in American history. He's a South Carolina politician and he's the ideological leader of the planter class. He's becoming much more important to sort of voice the ideology of the planter class. Um, he's gonna become a key player in the outbreak of the Civil War. At this time, uh, he's with Jackson and he becomes his vice president until 1832 when there is the nullification crisis. And I've included the speech by Jackson on the nullification crisis when John C. Calhoun breaks with Jackson. So the nullification crisis erupts in 1832 when South Carolina, this is uh, Calhoun State, nullifies the quote unquote tariff of abominations, which favors Northern manufacturers over Southern agricultural interests. So it's pulling at this sectional compromise within the party. Jackson had to threaten war in order to bring the Southerners back in line. And this was the only part of Jackson's legacy, which Abraham Lincoln praised. So Abraham Lincoln is a Whig through and through. He calls for a new party of Jefferson against the legacy of Jackson that survives in the Democratic Party. But this particular stance that Jackson takes against the Southerners is important to note. So he admires Jackson for a stand in nullification because he, Jackson, as a slaveholder, stood against the Southern planters in order to defend the Union. And his response to the Southerners, he reminds them that Jefferson had been for the Constitution. And at a toast on Jefferson's birthday celebration in 1830, Jackson addresses a general of South Carolina saying the following. He says, please give my compliments to my friends in your state and say to them that if a single drop of blood shall be shed there in opposition to the laws of the United States, I will hang the first man I can lay my hand on engaged in such treasonable conduct upon the first tree I can reach. So that gives you an insight into Jackson's temperament. So in summation, what is Jacksonian America here? It's not a revolt by the West. It's not the democratic revolution brought forth by Western expansion, as Turner had argued. 
nor was it the revolt of the working class against financial capital, as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. had argued in the, 18, in the 1940s, right? He's the New Deal politician, or New Deal uh, historian, rather. Right? He'd claimed that Jackson represented the revolt of the working class against the financiers. But of course, Jackson was the first president to call for federal troops to break up a strike. He broke up a strike of canal workers in 1834. He was no friend of the working men. And he managed through the bank war to bring Northern working men and Eastern local bankers with Southern planters into greater proximity, right? The bank wars actually allowed for these people to be, uh, uh, to be brought into a coalition, into a tighter sort of party discipline. Uh, the bank wars are when Jackson vetoes the rechartering of the National Bank, right? And this is not against all banks, but this is specifically against the National Bank. So there's several people in the Eastern uh, banking interests that are also against the rechartering of the National Bank. So these banking interests, Southern planters and Eastern working men are brought together and are sort of disciplined under the party by the bank wars that Jackson is leading. So the bank wars accelerated a party coalition both in Congress and in the state legislatures by clarifying party lines, tightening party disciplines, and generalizing the party imperative around the country. Okay, so neither is Jackson just, just a Southerner, right? It's not just like states rights, Southerner, slave owner, because as the nullification crisis shows us, he stands against the Southern plantocracy in the defense of the union, right? And he has to remind him that Jefferson is for the constitution. So Jackson is not the revolt of the, of the West. It's not the revolt of the working class. And it's not the revolt by the Southern plantocracy. So, so what is the Jacksonian party? So I think Jackson's party, the democracy, is the manager of society, of an emerging capitalist society. And in this way, it has Bonapartist elements. That is, the party becomes the manager of conflicting forces which aims to keep the party's leadership over society, right? So this is not the consolidation of Bonapartism that's gonna happen after 1848 and the United States happens after the American Civil War. But nonetheless, you can see emerging elements of this management of society through the party. And it's headed importantly by this war hero, right? This supposedly crude frontier man, not really. A man of the people, not really. As Richard Hofstadter and others have pointed out, Jackson was a land speculator who was part of the slave owning class. He was, he was no friend to the working man, right? So it's this mythos around the military legacy of Jackson that makes him the front runner um, for the party. Looming over this period in the United States was a fear of restoration, or to put it in the American context, the fear that the Republic would fall apart. And in a real fear, this was a temporary, a temporary game, that the revolution was in danger. At the inauguration of Jackson, people came from 500 miles away, wrote Daniel Webster. He says, and they really seem to think that the country is rescued from some dreadful danger. So what is the danger? Martin Van Buren had appealed to the public and noted back in 1812 that the United States was the last republic and the rulers of Europe had predicted that the Republic could, quote, never stand the crude, the rude shock of war. So I think that social transformations by the Jacksonians, or sorry, social transformations in the United States are misrecognized by Jacksonians, by Whig politicians, as well as men outside of the party, who characterize the problems of an emerging capitalist society as a sort of return of old problems. Right? So the problems are tyranny, despotism, and a new aristocracy. So if you see the appeal to the New Hampshire, New Hampshire electorate that I included in the primary readings, um, there are these calls to fight the new aristocracy. Right? And this is, this is a common language, not just of the Jacksonians, but even outside of the Jacksonians, outside of the Democratic Party, working men parties are using this language. Um, Working men parties, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but working men parties, it's important to note, are also part of this period of the end of the 1820s and the early 1830s. These were independent parties, and they rallied against what they were calling the new social tyranny. So it's not political tyranny, it's social tyranny, 
they blame selfish legislation and the monopoly of chartered manufacturers over labor. So Simpson, who I've included also in the primary readings is an example of this. The Democratic Party bemoaned the moneyed aristocracy, right? Um, so democracy against the moneyed aristocracy. And Theodore Fisk, his, his writings on capital against labor, um, show this, this argument, this new rising aristocracy that maybe has been implemented as a result of the British-American relations, right? Maybe it's a disease from the old world, of the old world, it's unclear. And Fisk, by the way, uh, whose capital and labor, against labor, I've included in the primary readings, is a, is a very key figure of Jackson, uh, sort of Jacksonian radical. In that, if you allow me just this, this one clarification, in that he is a pro-labor figure who is an anti-abolitionist. So he's against the abolitionists, but he's pro-labor. And in that he's typical of the Jacksonian radical, right? The democratic radicals, which are different than the working men parties who are actually working with the abolitionists, have exchanges on their newspapers, are, are, are printing um, uh, slave revolts, uh, announcements of slave revolts in their own newspapers, right? And it's historians that sort of see the development of labor politics as emerging through the Democratic Party that misinterpret the character of labor reform in this period as somehow being racist or an expression of whiteness, right? Because they look at these Jacksonian radicals and ignore the independent parties that are actually opposed to Jackson. Okay, so the working men parties have this social tyranny. This is the problem. The Jacksonian Democrats believe that there's a moneyed aristocracy that has arrived to the United States. And for the Whig party, they fear despotism, which for them is embodied in the figure of Andrew Jackson. So the opposition to Van Buren and Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party which is often left out of the story of Jacksonian America, is the Whig Party. So the other part of the second party system, the other party, formed with a specific intention to defeat Jackson and his new style of executive leadership. In 1833, a union of convenience among the anti-Masons, the ex-members of the defeated National Republican Party, and the ex-Federalists transpired in the Whig Party, bringing disparate political tendencies into a common opposition against Jackson, specifically. Whig stood for the political leadership of the affluent and the classically educated elite. They were in favor of commercial development, banking, and internal improvements, of so federal banking specifically. The Whigs resolved to change the democratic, sorry, the Whigs resolved to challenge the democratic bullies, as they called them, who for years had intimidated prospective voters, helping keep the city New York City specifically, under the control of Tammany Hall. So riots were common in this time around the voting periods. Um, they included thousands of Americans. In one instance, the mayor of New York City himself was clubbed to the ground as he tried to restore order. Um, this, this is a particularly hairy scene where there's a mobilization of 1,200 soldiers to separate these different political gangs and the Whig politicians. But political gangs are common in this period and they're sort of mobilized through the mass electorate under the Democratic Party. So thuggery and personal violence return to the arena of politics. It's never fully gone, right, in the, in the United States, in the history of the United States. But, you know, they're no longer living in the mob rule of tar and feathering days. And yet it comes back with a vengeance under Jackson. For example, Mike Walsh's uh, Spartan organization or Spartan Association. Uh, Mark Walsh is an Irish uh, labor reformer. And in 1840, his Spartan Association smashed up the Whig headquarters, um, for example. In the early 1840s, Tammany Hall had become dominated with fights between political and also just basically street gangs that were fighting over turf. They included the Dead Rabbits, the Bowery Boys, the Spartan Association that I just mentioned, the Roach Guards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, the masses and their criminal activities were channeled to maintain the Democratic Party control. For American Whigs, Jackson was Walpole, a military leader dressed in politicians' clothing who relied too heavily on executive power. Jackson inaugurated the history of the powerful executive leadership in the United States. He used his veto power more than all his predecessors combined 
and asserted the right of the chief executive to initiate legislation, which altered the president's relationship to Congress and made the president the head of state. He put Congress on notice that they must consider his views on all issues or run the risk of a veto. So instead of separate and equal branch of government, the president, according to Jackson, was the head of state, the first among equals, primus inter pares. Jackson summed up his assertion of presidential right by declaring that he alone, and not Congress, as was usually assumed, was the sole representative of the American people and responsible to them. Jackson's novel concept of the president served as the people's tribune, and this found immediate acceptance by the electorate, so it found immediate acceptance by the electorate, despite the warnings of the Whigs that the head of government would become the one person who would formulate national policy and direct public affairs. Senator Benjamin Lee of Virginia said, quote, until the president developed the faculties of the executive power, all men thought it inferior to the legislature. He manifestly thinks it's superior, and in his hands, it has proved much stronger than the representatives of the states. So it's Henry Clay that accuses Jackson of a, quote, open, palpable, and daring use of all powers of government. He says, we are in the midst of a revolution, hitherto bloodless and rapidly tending towards a total change of the pure Republican character of government. Right, so it's under Jackson that people, um, that, that people call the Democratic Party a form of mob rule, uh, the tyranny of the majority. So this revolution, it's a revolution, is how the opposition Whig Party characterizes Jackson presidency, right? Sort of counter-revolution, where the concentration of all power is in the hands of one man, as Clay had denounced it. Whig newspapers reprinted a cartoon showing Jackson as King Andrew I, clad in robes befitting an emperor, wearing a crown and holding a scepter in one hand and a scroll in the other on which was written the word veto. Within the Whig party, conscious Whigs like Charles Sumner and ex-anti-Masons like William Seward, among others, were avowed admirers of Jefferson and made public appeals to build on his legacy. And in the struggles leading up to the Civil War, it's these Whigs like Sumner who build on the legacy of Jackson, I'm sorry, who build on the legacy of Jefferson, it's Whigs like Sumner who build on the legacy of Jefferson to found a new party. So there's an experimental party, there's the Free Soil Party, there's also other parties like the Liberty Party and the Working Men's Party that I mentioned. Um, and the Free Soil Party is among the precursors to the Republican Party. So you can see that there's, there's also this, this attempt to sort of manage the sectional conflict and, and manage the different interests of the United States through the Whig Party. And in this, Clay is, as he was called, the Great Compromiser. Um, but the rift between the cotton Whigs, those connected to the South and Southern plantation interests, as well as the con conscious Whigs like Sumner, who were critiquing this connection between the Lords of the Loom and the Lords of the Lash, um, right, the textile interests of New England connected to the Southern plantations. Um, this comes to a head in the Mexican-American War of 1846, which is the precursor to the American Civil War that Spencer is going to talk about in the next, in the next session. So in the time that I have left, I would like to discuss the people that are outside of these parties, civil society, and the transformation of the Jeffersonian tradition, which is how I framed my lecture, that happens outside of both the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, that's gonna create the conditions for the birth of the Republican Party. So the people outside of the party are also transforming this Jeffersonian tradition by their clarification of the institution of free labor. And so what I would like to say is that this period is not only the onset of capitalism and the emergence of the parties, but also the struggle to overcome it, right? And so here, here are some examples of the ways in which people try to, try to build on the American revolutionary legacy, try to say that the revolution was incomplete. So the uniquely American preconditions of suffrage expansion are also the preconditions for the first labor parties of the world during the late 1820s and 1830s. From 1828 until 34, workies, as they were called, spread throughout the nation with organizations in at least 61 cities and towns. Where no independent political party was formed, laborers organized mechanics clubs that advocated changes in legislation that aimed to curb capital under the demands of working people. 
The first was Philadelphia's Working Men's Party and their platform from the basis for platforms elsewhere. Among what it called for, it called for many things, but just to highlight some of the things, it called for a free tax supported school system, the abolition of imprisonment for debt, the abolition of all licensed monopolies, an entire revision or abolition of the prevailing militia system, a less expensive legal system, equal taxation on property, the election of all officers by the vote of the people. Moreover, members of the party, members of these workers' parties, often protested against unsanitary and overcrowded housing conditions, the high cost of living, long working hours, low wages, and poor working conditions. And what I'd like to highlight is that from these working men associations, which included, you know, what we'd consider middle class reformers, like reformers at the time, right, which are not, on, not only workers, it's in these associations that there's a move away from the agrarian ideal as the only inheritance of the Jeffersonian legacy towards the shorter hours reform, that is the shortening of the working day. So it's from this reconfiguration of the Jeffersonian tradition in the workies that we get the calls for shorter hours, the shorter working day. So Philadelphia's William Hyten is one of the important figures. He argued that the production of abundance, right, created by manufacturing technology could be part of the common good if laborers could retain, quote, a due and equitable proportion of the products of their labor. It's in this period where laborers quote Benjamin Franklin's writings on the shortening, on the shortening working day. And they say, um, and they quote Franklin about how machinery ought to be used to advance the greater incrementation of free time. Right? So they're quoting Jefferson on the time to think, and they're quoting Benjamin Franklin. At 4th of July celebrations in the Northeast, these reformers connected the nation's founding documents to the promise for shorter hours. Quote, but what has the 10 hour system to do with this day? Why, it is a part of the Declaration of Independence, the pursuit of happiness, end quote. Across New England meetings in the early 1830s, Boston carpenter and leading shorter hours reformer, Seth Luther, Seth Luther, called on the producing classes to recognize themselves as the source of all wealth and asked why they, quote, enjoyed so small a portion of it themselves. Luther noted that employers were dependent on workers for, quote, for the protection of that property, which they have obtained from your bones and sinews and heart's blood, right? So he's speaking to these working people. Luther placed the urban producer as an independent and indispensable, rather an indispensable force in the success of manufacturing property by identifying labor as the source of the employer's wealth. So these characters were in dialogue with Ricardi and socialists at the time, chartists, and we're bringing back the legacy of the American Revolution to speak to the problem of labor in the age of Jackson. Uh, Luther argued that employer success was wholly dependent on laborers, on, on their force. So according to Heighten, the presence of machinery and the massive expansion of manufacturing revealed that, quote, the means of creating wealth sufficient to supply every individual with the greatest abundance was already available. To use this new productive capacity in advancing liberty, he proposed reducing the working hours of laborers in proportions to the advance made in the temporal speed up of production. So this is heightened again. Instead of our having to labor at, a present, at present from 10 to 16 hours per day for a mere subsistence, that in exact proportion as scientific improvements and inventions increase, our labor may be in the same proportion be diminished from 12 to 10 hours per day and from that down to eight, to six, and so on, until the development and progress of science has reduced human labor to its lowest term. Throughout the 1840s, laborers addressed state legislatures, so they, they had petitions, um, et cetera, whom they accused of turning a blind eye, a blind eye to social inequalities reproduced by the so-called social tyranny, this new tyranny. And the word tyranny here no longer described the government under King George III, but rather a new quote, as they called it, tyrant capital. That is, a tyrant capital, quote, in conflict with the natural rights of society. This new social tyranny was unknown to the citizens of the 18th century. It's the association of mechanics that formed in Fall River, Massachusetts for the reduction of the working day explained. Social tyranny and depression that result from the long working hours are a worse evil for the poor working men to endure than political despotism 
because they stare him in the face every day of his existence, grind him into the dust, wither his hopes and happiness of his family, and poison the domestic endearments of his life. This new social tyranny, which, quote, debased the masses to a level with the surf of the old countries, was fundamentally incompatible with their vision of a free American republic. And only through the eradication of social tyranny, they argued, could the republic truly guarantee a freedom for all. Their newspapers and pamphlets show that the self-education of working people was the basis for this reform activity. So for example, we're learning, when learning about the fate of English factory workers, reformers also learned about the Factory Act of 1833, which included the limitation of working hours. From these findings, Massachusetts workers, which by the way include this educated farm girls of New England, which make the first factory workers in the United States, they conclude that, quote, if it is right to legislate in England upon this subject, it cannot be wrong here, since the cases are precisely alike, and American manufacturers were, quote, possessed of the same disposition of those of England. So they're making connections in their, um, uh, in their exchanges in their newspapers with Chartists, etc. Among the highlights of this early shorter hours period, we find the British transplant Chartist John Kluwer who proposed a national strike, or what he called a second independence, built on this conception of self-government, as well as on the French revolutionary Count Fonet's idea of a divided people. So L. W. Rickman, the president of the New England Working Men's Association, rallied behind a comparable plan for a, quote, industrial revolutionary government to direct the legal political action of the working men so as to destroy the hostile relations that are present prevailing between capital and labor, end quote. So an industrial revolutionary government that is to destroy the relations at present prevailing between capital and labor built on the work of Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and on the Chartists, right? That's, that's the legacy of the American Revolution among the labor reformers of this era. So after the Jacksonian era, uh, Ira Stewart, who's Boston's reformer for the eight hour day, the working man philosopher, builds on this history, right? So people know the eight hour fight, the eight hour struggles that happened after the American Civil War, but essentially what I've laid out was its prehistory. And it is fundamentally built on the Declaration of Independence, on the legacy of the revolution. A renewed period of labor mobilization for the eight hour day ensued after the American Civil War at the height of industrialization, when theoretical and strategic contributions by Stuart drew greater attention to the international organization of production and the role of a global working class. Stuart, by the way, was frustrated with how the Democrats' hard money policies and the denunciations of the bank distracted working men away from building independent political power. And he complains, for example, to one of the German 1848ers in America, Friedrich Sorge, who's one of the heads of the first international in the United States, about the need for an independent political power away from the distractions of the hard money policy reform. And why I'm harping on this point is because these veteran working men and members of these associations, of these reform associations, do end up, some of them at least we know, um, according to historian Mark Laus, in 1854 in Wisconsin, calling for the return to Jefferson. And if Laus is right, and if his archival findings are right, it's one of them that proposes the name, the Republican Party, as an ode to Jefferson. And so again, the split of the Jeffersonian tradition in antebellum America does not only happen within the parties. Importantly, the conditions for the Republican Party are also being prepared outside of the party. That is, there is no thread from Jefferson to Jackson to Lincoln. There is a thread between Jefferson and Lincoln, but the thread connecting Jefferson to Lincoln is to be found outside of the Democratic Party. The reconfiguration of the revolutionary tradition in the United States did occur in the Democratic and Whig parties, but importantly, also within these vast voluntary associations, these reading, reading circles, these corresponding societies, these independent newspapers, lecture groups, which the French liberal Alexis de Tocqueville identified as critical in the discourse of civil society, as the large free schools of a democratic people. These institutions are where reformers discuss Locke, Smith, 
Benjamin Franklin, where they wrote their support for the 1848 European revolutions and established letter exchanges with Chartists on the English Factory Acts and the General Strike. It's these civil society institutions which have been occluded because the history of the parties has become the history of America. And so we think in Platypus that this history of civil society and the continuation of the American Revolution should be redeemed. That's it. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Pam. Um, so maybe we can start with, uh, we have two questions from Richard in the Q&A box. Um, I would encourage all of our audience members to write in your questions or to raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, so, okay, we can start with Richard's question. Um, the first one is, although you mentioned Clay in passing, you did not say much about him. What is your assessment of the political trajectory of Henry Clay? Um, well, he's, he's known for, I think in my mind, for two things, you know, he's, he's the develop, he's, he forces the development of the American system, which supports the domestic manufacturing and internal improvements. So he sees himself as a sort of continuation of the Hamiltonian tradition in that sense. And then he's the great compromiser. So in, in political practice, he's the one that com that, that, that sort of writes and becomes the negotiator for the Southern plantocracy and the Northern Republicans, right? So he plays a similar role, I guess, than Martin Van Buren does in the Democratic Party, just less successfully so to some extent in terms of the founding of the Democratic Party being a much more popular and successful endeavor. And importantly, he's the mentor to Abraham Lincoln. And so, um, but I'm not sure what else I can say about Clay. I think Clay is, is, is connected much more to the 18th century traditions than he is to a sort of Lincoln uh, and Sumner development of the Whig tradition. Um, and he's a respected figure, but I'm not sure what else, what else I can say about Clay. Okay, um, we'll take the second question from Richard. Um, and then I've got a question if, um, if others are a little gun shy. Okay, so Richard's second question. Um, how does the Jacksonian Revolution compare or contrast to contemporary events in France and England, the Revolution of 1830 and the Reform Bill? Um, I know you touched on a, a part of this, Pam, already in your lecture, but if you want to quickly address this too. I mean, to some extent, there's the opening of the, I mean, so already in the 1820s, there's the expansion of suffrage. So I think that already in the United States, the problem of, of, of working people and the relationship of working people to the manufacturing interest, it comes earlier, right, in the United States, it seems. Um, I think that Chris mentioned the other day that in, within the revolutions of 1830 in France, there's this denunciation also of the um, financial aristocracy. And so I think that there's this grasping in both the United States, as well as in France, at least, um, this, this new emergent sort of power um, that you know is being characterized as part of the old system returning, right? The aristocratic system, uh, the old disease returning. Um, but I, I don't I don't know enough to to make any larger conclusions about the connections across the three nations. Okay. Um, all right. I'll I'll take the uh, opportunity then to ask you a question, Pam. So. Um, one of the things that um, stuck out to me from, from your lecture was your characterization of Jackson as an early kind of proto-Bonapartist. Um, and I'm trying to reflect on how it does or does not change the way that we understand Bonapartism as Marxists uh, to call Jackson kind of a proto-Bonapartist. So I, I guess the implication would be that in the 1830s, um, is it your view that the nullification crisis, uh, you know, already means that the bourgeoisie is no longer like capable of leading um, in the United States? And then uh, the second part of the question would be, you know, obviously there's also a kind of characterization that we sometimes talk about as Lincoln um, being the first Bonapartist. So, you know, how do we, I guess, yeah, how do we take the historical significance of, of calling Jackson that? Yeah, I think that, like I said, I was trying to be careful with this term because I think it's the emergence of elements of Bonapartism. And primarily what I mean is this um, sort of negotiation and management, right? The key word being management 
of these conflicting interests that are emerging across the nation, which include these working men in the East and these banking interests and these Southern planters um, under the discipline of the party. And that the party sees itself as managing a potential crisis in society. And so it's ushering in the emergence of capitalist society by sort of, um, by compromising across these different sectors. Um, but it's not the case that, you know, Jackson is not, um, the United States is not being, is, is not centralized in this way. It's not, it's not going to, it's going to, federal power is not being imposed in the same way that's going to happen under Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so th these are the characteristics that I think are important. And it's the issue of democracy, right? How the party is being presented as a kind of democratizing agent, as returning sovereignty to the people. And actually what it's doing is presenting the party as the vehicle for sovereignty. So power to the people, sovereignty back to the people actually just means power to the Democratic Party. And in that sense, I think the party is being lifted above society. The state thus is being lifted above society um, in this sort of Bonapartist sense, if that, if that helps to explain what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that definitely helps clarify. Um, okay, we're gonna take Dane's question. Um, Pam, could you explain a little more how contra to Schlesinger's, sorry if I butchered that name, narrative, uh, Jackson created a party combining bankers and Southern planters. How, if at all, was he able to reconcile these competing interests? And is there a similar chaos in his administration as there was in Napoleon's administration, Louis Napoleon's administration? Mm -hmm. Um, it's the Eastern uh, local banking interests that are also against the chartering, the rechartering of the National Bank, which is this inheritance of um, the Hamilton project of, um, of the National Bank. And so it's these Eastern banking interests that are then against the bank that can then, because there is a bank war that brings the urban working men, as well as the Southern planters, they can sort of make a coalition around the issue of the rechartering of the bank. So that's, that's what I mean. And it sort of presents the party as necessary, right? Because if not, the Whigs are going to help to recharter this bank. So it sort of consolidates an opposition across these different interests. Um, is there a similar chaos in his administration as there was in Louis Napoleon's administration? Um, I'm not, I'm not so, I'm not so sure what it means here in this, the chaos. Could you maybe, could Dane, could you just clarify what you mean by the chaos? Maybe he could tell us. Because there was certainly pulling apart of, there's always this threat, right? That the coalition is gonna be pulled apart and the threat recurs in 1832 um, with the nullification crisis. Hi, can you, yeah, so can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Dane. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just referring to the, um, um, I think it's at the end of the 18th Brumaire when Marx talks about how Louis Napoleon, he's having to like, you know, grab one thing from one interest group and how it's, um, you know, he's having to play off a lot of different things. He's having like found the Republic anew constantly. I just got the sense from that, that like in having to manage these competing interests, there was a certain chaos within his administration. So it might not be a proper comparison, but that, that was what I was referring to, that last part near the end of the 18th Brumaire, where we, Marx talks about Louis Napoleon having to balance all these conflicting things, and it, you get a very chaotic impression. I see. I mean, there's certainly the case, you know, the Mexican-American War just breaks this into um, sort of into the surface. But um, there, there's this kind of funny thing that Jackson and Van Buren had to do because they want to keep the West and so they can't be entirely against Clay's um, system for internal improvements because in order for the West to be successful it has to continue to it has to be tied to the rest of the nation and so like there's there's a bit of fudging that happens when they critique uh, the Whig policies they can't be completely against um, some of the main tenets of Clay, and yet they have to present themselves as being in opposition to Clay, who's the ideological leader of the Whig Party. And the same can be said, and maybe more importantly so, with the Southern part of the of the Democratic Party, right, which which is chaotic and and gives way to um, to a war. Um, and already you can see this in '32, and with Calhoun stepping down from uh, being vice president of Jackson. So so absolutely, there's this attempt to sort of keep keep things together that 
Um, but it, but they do keep things together for, for a while, um, at least. And it disciplines people. I mean, it's successful to the extent that it sort of gives the nation a new image of the party, right? Um, it establishes the party as a new institution of management in that way, even if they, and they, they fail um, through the civil war to maintain it. Um, thanks, Dane, and thanks, Pam. Um, our next question is from Will. Um, Will asks, uh, you mentioned that these numerous voluntary associations have been occluded, and instead it's the history of mass parties like the Democrats that become the way people remember this history. Uh, when and how does this happen? Um, I think the question is about when and how does this happen in historiography? Is it mostly an issue for historians or for contemporary politics as well? Well, I think I was trying to connect this um, 1940s historiography, this Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Um, narrative. So uh, Schlesinger writes like the most important book of Jackson in America, um, The Age of Jackson. And, and, peop and there are historians today, for example, Sean Willens, um, who writes about the emerging capital relations in New York and also the Jacksonian period. And they just take for granted and John Ashworth. There's, there's a tradition in, by historians of just treating this period as, as the history of the parties. And then even when they're talking about civil society associations or these reformers that are outside of the parties, they sort of say like they have a democratic perspective, capital D, right? Like they have the same perspective as, as the parties. So they see them as a kind of um, like pressure tactic on the democratic party. So they sort of project back onto these civil society associations as if they were an extension of the parties. And I think importantly, while this is the emergence of this, this new mass disciplined party, the United States still really values its civil society associations. And there are lots of them. And especially in the 1830s, um, there's, a, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of utopian societies, independent newspapers, schools for working people, lecture series, um, uh, reading circles, I mean, the new fact, the, the factory girls that I mentioned briefly that, that are coming out of New England, they form their own reading circles, they start their own newspapers. And so, and in these, in these circles, you have these arguments about whether or not they should just be, you know, for the Democratic Party. And there's a lot of dissent that happens as to how to present their critiques of manufacturing interest and, and, and what the manufacturers are doing in New England. And I think that that's lost if it's seen as an extension of this. When does that happen? I mean, I think that the 1940s historiography and the New Deal historiography, right, especially is, is a culprit of this. And I think we've just kind of inherited this perspective on the Jacksonian period as being primarily defined by, by the parties. I mean, and for the purposes of American history, right, I should say, for the purposes of just kind of a general American history to understand the history of, of America, it is, it is key understanding Jacksonian America to understand the emergence of the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. But for the purposes of platypus and the question of in what way does American uh, society continue to be revolutionary? In what way does the American Revolution task the different generations of Americans? I really thought that talking about this history outside of the party would be especially important because it's here where there's this kind of reinterpretation of Jeffersonian ideals. And it's, it's not really like Jefferson, um, or rather uh, Abraham Lincoln does not inherit Jackson's uh, notion of free labor, right? So the, the clarification of the institution of free labor on, Jeff, on a Jeffersonian basis is happening importantly outside of the Democratic Party and outside of the Whig Party as well. Although, like I said, the conscience Whigs, you know, like, like Seward, um, like Sumner rather, uh, were also important in this regard. Our next question uh, is from Michael. Uh, you talked about the early political efforts of workers in the 1800s. Could you contrast the discontent and unrest among these workers, the workers in Europe in the early and mid 1800s with the workers in America? And maybe if it's not unconnected, was the formation of American parties any kind of response to civil unrest or was it more or less an alignment of money interests? I'm just going to read this over again. Um, 
to contrast it. I mean, I think the most important contrast is again, the fact that you have this extension of suffrage um, to working people by the 1820s. And so you have a new argument of how to politically organize and um, but also the fact is that the artisan system is still quite strong in the United States and it, it's, it's going under a decline in the Jacksonian period, but you have these artisans until the end of the 1840s. And then you have, you have Southern slavery. I mean, like really that's, that's a key contrast. And you can see it also um, in these planters who are now writing about slavery in a new way, looking to the European conflicts between laborers and the rest of society saying, you know, that conflict is going to come to the United States, like these workers in the streets of London in 1839, like all of these problems that the European societies are experiencing are going to come to America. And what saves the United States from this class divisions um, are the, uh, is the institution of slavery. It's the fact that we have slavery to mediate, to prevent the outbreak of labor versus capital. Um, and working people in New England and in other parts of the Eastern Seaboard, they recognize that now slavery has taken a more sort of positive, like there's more positive argument about, about slavery. Um, so I would say that most importantly, the extension of suffrage and the fact that these working people can form these parties um, and sort of think about what the political power, right, is in the hands of working people, what this is about. Um, but also, again, like the, the, it's unclear for working people whether or not you will have something like industrialization, right? Like advanced manufacturing capital in America. And this, were, this is where land sort of remains this, this like third way, this, this other way, this like way outside of class conflict. And among the national reform associations, among the sort of agrarian reformers, there what they imagine is that if you if you can break up the territories, if you can give people land, then you're not going to have this like you know wage workers in the cities. You can siphon off like land could be sort of a safety valve to prevent the conflict between labor and capital. So the southerners had a version of this with slavery, and the northern reformers had a version of this with land. Right, that that land could prevent the outbreak of class society essentially in the United States. Um, our next question is from Spencer. Uh, you speak of Jefferson as reconciling himself to merchant and manufacturing interests towards the end of his life. But on the whole, you treat Jefferson as if he were a representative of agrarian interests or even as if Jefferson sought to politically impose an agrarian ideal which casts Jefferson as an illiberal opponent of history as such. So what about Jefferson's support in the cities? Also, you speak of the emergence of wage labor as equivalent to the emergence of capitalism, uh, but does, doesn't this confuse matters? So Jefferson seems to reconcile himself by the end of his life that the cities are going to be the new centers of American society. And I mean, he even writes to his um, daughter-in-law, who I think is in New England, and that he wishes that you know more little New Englands would appear would appear in the South. So he's he's positive about how cities have become sort of centers of public discourse and exchange and intellectual life. The issue of manufacturing, I think, is really changed by the War of 1812. So I think that there's this recognition that Jefferson has, and he writes to the. Um, the Polish revolutionary that fights in the American Revolution, Kuzutsko, about how now he sees that manufacturing interests um, and the development of domestic manufacturing specifically is critical to maintain the independence of the Republic. So I think in this way, um, he reconciles himself. But when you read what Jefferson has to say about like the factories, I and mean, he has a very, I, you know, his, his notion of factories are going to be like peaceful factories, and sort of idyllic um, uh, uh, landscapes. And he's not against commerce at all. I mean, he was never against commerce, even in, in his idea of a human farmer. He thought that the human farmers would be connected in a kind of peaceful uh, commercial exchange. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the version of, of Jefferson uh, in terms of the manufacturing interests and, and commerce. Um, I don't think he's a representative of agrarian interests. I just want to clarify that. I think that what I wanted to say at the beginning of my lecture was that 
he did have an ideal vision of bourgeois society in the United States as emerging from these peacefully connected yeoman farmers, these small producers. I don't think that's an agrarian interest, right? It's meaning it's not, it's not the interest of capitalist society that the farmers represent one interest against another. Um, he just thought the Republic would be shaped by these independent producers. Um, that's what he saw as the agrarian ideal, right? So not, not interests, but the ideal of the development of bourgeois society. Um, but he's not an illiberal opponent to history. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what this means here. Um, I don't think that this is incompatible with, with uh, liberal ideals, uh, in fact, right? Because he spent so much time talking about how landed property can be the means through which people can develop their faculties, can realize their potential, can have the time to think and the energy to participate in peaceful commerce and exchange of ideas, etc. So that's Jefferson's ideal vision. Um, and the emergence of wage labor is equivalent to the emergence of capitalism. Um, no. So in the beginning of the lecture, and I think I sort of zoomed by, uh, zoomed um, through this bit, but I, I did spend some time talking about and describing what I mean by the emergence of capitalist society. Um, and I don't, I don't want to go through this, this whole thing again, um, but it is a transformation of social relations that is not just about uh, the emergence of wage labor, right? It has to do with the transformation of farming into commercial farming. It has to do with the new centers of power of commerce being in the cities. It has to do with the transformation of single commodity production. It has to do with the absorption of um, farming women from New England into the new textile factories. Um, and importantly, unemployment, right? And the crises of the first half of the 19th century, uh, mass unemployment is a huge part of the emergence of this capitalist order. Um, and the direction of wealth and value that I'm arguing that Hamilton and Jefferson cannot foresee. Um, so I, I hope that that clarifies. Maybe, um, could I ask like Spencer to maybe clarify what he means by this so that he could say a bit more? Um, yeah, can we unmute Spencer? Can you hear me? Um, yeah, about, I mean, I guess my concern with the discussion of Jefferson is in this notion of an ideal or a vision, as opposed to giving scope to what exists and the potential of society, right? In other words, there were yeoman farmers, and Jefferson was, of course, encouraging their flourishing. But to say that he has an ideal is to say, in a sense, that he could oppose the direction of the development of society. And that's why I said that to speak of Jefferson as having an agrarian ideal or a yeoman farmer ideal is a language taken from historiography that is ultimately casting Jefferson as illiberal. Uh, and, and, and that's my, that's that question. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I'm concerned also that, um, you know, the breakdown of artisanal production and of subsistence farming, the commercialization of farming, uh, should be viewed as capitalist. Uh, as opposed to bourgeois. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Uh, thanks, Spencer. So, I mean, again, I'm just going to make the point about the agrarian, the agrarianism and the ideal of that. Um, I think that Jefferson, as opposed to Hamilton, does see, and in his words, it would be uh, the small producer republic, right? And that in the small producer republic that he has as a vision, I mean, ideal, I mean here as a sort of desirable development that's already taking place in his moment and he wants to encourage, I agree with that formulation, but that he foresees that this will flourish 
into the small producers republic and the key component of the small producers republic is the free yeoman farmer which he wants to replace for example the southern plantocracy right um and again i don't think this is illiberal and i never said this in my in my lecture but rather um he he thinks that these people will be connected through peaceful commercial exchange so there's plenty of room in jefferson for commerce as such in this in this way as peaceful the peaceful commercial exchange across the yeoman farmers um but that this notion this this sort of future uh that he wants to encourage uh doesn't play out and i think that that is a different vision of um of bourgeois society in the united states that hamilton has with the encouragement of manufacturing specifically with banking etc which he thinks are what's necessary to lift american citizens so that they can sell their labor and through the exchange of the labor surpass any kind of need for land right and that's that's the i think that's the primary sort of difference between these these two of them but i by no means and uh i do not think and hopefully no one takes it away that jefferson is somehow illiberal um that's not what i meant um the emergence of wage labor and these things i mean i i guess you know in my understanding the issue is this unemployment crisis the unemployment crisis that return through each of the panics um which are are often recur often in the first half of the 19th century and this seems to me to be like quite a shock um and so maybe i should have emphasized this right like creating a kind of like superlative labor um this this or, or rather um sort of an excess of labor um as being the emergence of of capitalist society um so is the breakdown of artists and of the artisan system bourgeois um yes i guess it can be the independent shopkeepers etc um the breakup of the the of of the artisan system but what happens instead is that uh the breakup of the artisan system leads to the rise of these these new institutions of labor and at first at first they i would say they're sort of compatible with bourgeois society so at first in the textile new england factories for example these women who are taken from the farms they're taken from the farms by the way because it's the, so they're cheaper than paying for uh these other working people um that you can pay them less um but these working women that are involved in the textile factory factories are happy to earn wages and like that they can have an independent life away from the factories and they end up uh moving to the cities after they leave the factories so once they had their temporary stint under factory labor they end up being more independent sort of bourgeois free subjects but this is quickly taken over by a more pernicious system of permanent wage labor and these uh working new england girls are replaced by irish immigrants who have no means of reproducing themselves and end up getting paid much less and so you have the deterioration quite quickly from the breakup of the artisan system into a kind of pernicious uh wage labor which you know produces unemployment and crises etc so um perhaps that's the thing that i would like to emphasize the problem of unemployment which is an unbelievable problem for a lot of americans like they can't believe that it has arrived um into the united states i hope that clarifies um great we're going to take uh chris's question next i think you addressed this already but could you say more about not only jefferson's relation to utopian socialism idyllic factories but also the utopian socialists own relation to us politics in the 1820s to 30s yeah yeah this happens also mediated through the working men parties um you know there so fanny wright who chris quoted from who's one of these utopian socialists and robert owen um are uh part of the new york working men party um which which has different factions and they're part of a more moderate faction but nonetheless um they are the ones that are you know printing uh, thomas jefferson's image in their newspapers and saying complete the revolution um and so there is in the 1830s as i mentioned earlier this this uh, this outburst of this this sort of um uh 
massive amounts of associations, parties, independent newspapers, and the utopian socialists are a big part of this. And they're not only from the Owen tradition, so there's Owenites, but there's also Fourierites, like, you know, Charles Fourier. Um, and many of them, like L.W. Rickman, who I quoted, he's the guy that wanted the industrial revolutionary government. He's a Fourierite, and he's part of one of these utopian socialist societies um, for some time in New England. So they kind of come together again through the workies and through these reform associations. Some end up being more hostile to the shorter working hours day and more married to the kind of agrarian notion of land reform. Right, so a lot of these utopian socialists end up preferring a kind of land reform over what South Luther and others are going to call for, which is embrace the, the capacities of manufacturing, embrace the capacities of abundance, of the production of, of abundance, and call for the shorter working day. And so these, these things sort of, sometimes they're at odds, sometimes they're reconciled. With L.W. Rickman, they're reconciled. And Horace Greeley, who Spencer will talk about in in the next uh, session, who's, who's, who's important because he, he gives, uh, marks the opportunity to state his perspectives on the American Civil War in the New York Tribune, is also a Fuhrerite. Like he's, he's one of these utopian socialist types. Um, and so it's, it's definitely this outside of the party, this reconfiguration of the Jeffersonian tradition that's happening through these working men parties, et cetera is in part absorbing these utopian socialists. And these utopian socialists, I should say, like Fanny Wright and Robert Owen, are going to influence the way that people consider this kind of challenge uh, to emerging capital relations. Um, I should say, by the way, um, Robert Owen is so, it's so popular. Uh, the utopian socialist Robert Owen is so popular that um, a, a maquette of one of his utopian societies sits in the White House for, I think, a week, I believe. This is an Alex Gorovich's book. So this, I mean, it, it didn't, it wasn't seen as threatening, you know, like these utopian socialist communities at the time. Um, and so they, they gain a new, more kind of radical articulation through people like uh, Seth Luther and Ira Stewart later, who are going to say, well, there's not something that can be reconciled in, in the, you know, in, in these like little utopian experiments. There needs to be a conflict between labor and capital. And, you know, you know, whether or not like actually I.R. Stewart thought that it could be resolved in the state is another question. He's more Lasallian actually in his conception of how it's going to be resolved in the state. Um, but, but yeah, they're, they're around and they're hugely influential. Um, maybe I can ask uh, one more of, of my questions, um, unless there's somebody else. Um, so I thought that something that came out of your lecture and also the readings that you assigned us is that, you know, both the opposition to the moneyed interest by the Jackson radicals and then the opposition to Jackson himself um, is kind of couched in the language of like being against um, tyranny and despotism, like meaning they don't recognize that there's like a new problem. Like it's still like in the pamphlet that you assigned, it's still like we're fighting the kings and we're fighting the despots and like the, you know, the, the people who don't work. So I, I guess in what way is, um, is or is not the formation of the Republican Party in your mind kind of adequate or a recognition that like, hey, there's new problems that society needs to contend with. It's not just about fighting you know, the first estate or something. I mean, obviously one of your big provocations I thought at the end of your lecture is the suggestion that the Republican Party actually came from working men's associations. I feel like that's a pretty provocative, um, you know, I guess thing that I haven't heard before. So yeah, maybe- Well, I wanted to be clear. I mean, the Republican Party doesn't come from these organizations. I just wanted to make, um, I, the, my proposition was that Historians make this connection that Abraham Lincoln inherits Jefferson through Jackson, right? Like this is the Schlesinger argument. This is Sean Willens. This is like, so New Deal historiography onward to the present. It's Jefferson, Jackson, Abraham Lincoln. And that's just not the case, right? So you have, you have Jefferson, then you have this massive transformation of the party system, which includes these massive uh, uh, associations of reform that include the utopian socialists, include others. And then you have, then you have Lincoln, but Lincoln is 
Lincoln's party, I should say, re the Republican party, is absorbing also part of the, the Whig faction, the conscience Whigs. It's absorbing the, 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 the Free Soil Party, um, Charles Sumner's um, project, and it's absorbing men from the Liberty Party, which is this abolitionist party um, founded in the 1830s. And, and it's, it's, so it's a coalition of a different type um, I think that, that Spencer should talk about this next week. But so I just want to clarify, though, I'm not saying that the Republican Party was sort of founded by these working parties, but there is archival evidence to show, at least in my point, which is that the members of these working men parties and these associations were present in Wisconsin in the founding of the party, and that one of them may have suggested the name. And I think that's just significant because they were suggesting the name as an honor to Jefferson, right? They were saying, like, we need to return to Jefferson in the same sort of sentiment. Um, that Lincoln, the Lincoln would have done. Um, I don't think it falls to me to clarify what is new about the Republican Party, but I will say that in terms of the misrecognition in this period, I think there is an attempt to use the old language to try to clarify what is new, right? And I think that what I was trying to bring out in the working men parties and these associations was this use of the term social tyranny that now comes to represent a different kind of tyranny than political tyranny. So it's this clumsy language to some extent, but it's the, it's the idea that you can have political equality. And um, George Julian, um, Julian, Julian Harney, who's the, the chartist, who ends up in the United States, he actually ends up interviewing Abraham Lincoln, he has, he has this great quote about how, you know, the working men in the United States may be blinded by the fact that they've gained the vote, but they still don't have their freedom. And so, um, and it's this, this problem of like social unfreedom, but political equality. And again, these are clumsy terms to deal with this emergence of this new problem. And I think that's what the language is trying to grasp without sort of calling it by, by its name. But, you know, already Ira Stewart, like Ira Stewart and, and some of the people in the, in the later 1840s and 1850s, like they're looking to Smith, Ricardo, they're taking the critiques of political economy, they're taking the Ricardian socialists at the time that Marx is going to critique. They're adopting this language of political economy to try to deal with what is new in their moment, right? So they, they find that this Republican language is not enough, that the, 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 the Republican liberal language is not enough to describe um, the problem. And so they're grasping through the language of political economy to say there is a conflict here, there's, there's a problem. Got it, thank you. Um, uh, okay, next we have uh, James, who's one of the other lecturers for this series. Um, so he, we're gonna unmute him. Can you hear me? Uh, great. I, I have two questions. They're both about Lincoln. I realize he will be a central figure next week, but obviously because he's the second most important figure, I mean, he's the most important figure in U.S. political history following Jefferson. I wanted to ask two questions about him in this period because he's coming, obviously, into political maturity, political self-consciousness. Um, one, Pam, is, is a very minor question. How did like, I, I thought it was really excellent the way you, you underscored breaking that progressive New Deal historiography that talks about a link from Jefferson to Jackson to Lincoln. And I wanted to know how did, in, 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 in breaking the Jackson part of that, how did that progressive New Deal historiography deal with the fact that, um, obviously, Lincoln always said all honor to Jefferson, but how did they deal with the fact that Lincoln constantly claimed himself to be a Henry Clay Whig? I, that was one question I had for you. How did they do that? And the second question I have is, by the end of your period, the 1840s and 50s, Lincoln is constantly talking about the fact that the entire system of the American Revolution is under threat. He's saying all the time that Jefferson's declaration is under threat. And, and, and what, I'm, what, what this often is linked to simplistically his view as, of a slave power conspiracy, but I'm wondering in what sense do you think that, that Lincoln sees the entire developments and consolidations of, these, of this period, the, the development of the second party system, the Democratic Party, and these developments by the 1840s, you know, their consolidation by the 1840s and 50s as actually the totality of that threat? I guess a clear way to putting this is, is, is the historiography wrong to simply reduce Lincoln's view that that the entire American revolutionary system is under threat to 
a slave power conspiracy, but actually he has a sensibility about the totality of these developments is threatening the American revolutionary system. It's a good question, James. I don't know if I if I have a good answer for it. I would say two things, and, and you know, maybe the less important answer, which is how it's dealt with in the historiography, is so it's just it's it's mostly ignored. Um, I think, um, and and sort of to great detriment. Um, I, I can't think of. I mean, the person that deals with this actually is Eric Foner in his biography of Lincoln, which he's you know he's really clarifying Lincoln's connection to. Um, to Henry Clay, um, and does so, I think, also through a kind of Enlightenment tradition, if I remember correctly. Spencer will have to chime in. But um, I, I think that also it's this issue of the Republic and, and what constitutes the free Republic. And of course, this has to do with um, the institution of free labor, but, but also um, like the, the sort of premise of the premise of self-government, and how, at least under the Whig um, administration or through the Whig party, they have a critique of how Jackson is actually violating, right? He's, he's saying that it's sovereignty to the people, but in fact, he's created a sort of like corrupt machinery that reinstitutes these partisan loyal members of the party into positions of power. And the Whigs think that they have, I mean, they have this sort of, um, way of assessing uh, who ought to rule, right? The, the, the sort of educated men of, of property. Um, but there's a way that it could be vulgarized, right? What I mean by the, the educated men of property, it's not just like the capitalist, right? It's not like the Whigs want just like the capitalist to rule. Um, but they want like education is a huge part of the Whig agenda, right? So they want universal education. And, and they think that um, people ought to better themselves to be exposed to cosmopolitan ideals, to, to develop a sense of the history of the nation, to uh, develop themselves in literature and art. Um, and John Quincy Adams is a huge part of this. So is Charles Sumner. I mean, they, they're, they're trips that some of the key Whig politicians make to Europe during the 1830s and 1840s. And they want to create a system of education that exposes the Americans to the, the great sort of like cultural uh, uh, wealth of, 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 of European life. Um, and what they think is that the Jackson and the Democratic Party are doing a violence to this, the sort of necessity for self-betterment um, and the realization of self-betterment, but just uh, including people as they are in the political management of, of the state, right? So they do believe in Tocqueville's um, warning Right, that the tyranny of the majority, the tyranny of, of the uneducated masses is not necessarily the continuation of the American Revolution, but maybe its downfall. And I think that Lincoln takes that quite seriously. Um, but I'm sure this will come up again um, in the next session. Uh, yeah, so that's my partial, that's my partial answer about Clay and the Whigs and the Whig inheritance in Lincoln. Okay, um, I can follow that up uh, with another question. Um, so I, I found your I found your discussion of Van Buren versus the founding fathers um, really fascinating because I think in your portrayal, right, Van Buren kind of thinks that party politics is desirable and it's representative of popular or it can express popular interests, whereas. Um, you know, your point was that for the founding fathers, party politics would have been seen as, as undesirable. And I'm reminded actually of Chris Catron's piece on class consciousness, where he talks about how, you know, for the bourgeois uh, politicians, um, they would have seen politics as like a dirty job, but somebody has to, somebody has to do it. Um, so how would you, I guess, is there, and maybe you can clarify, was there a specific historical dynamic um, and that in your lecture, perhaps the need to manage the slave versus the Northern financial and manufacturing interests, is that the specific dynamic that is the occasion for the disintegration of this bourgeois vision of like, um, there should be no career politicians. And, you know, it's just a 
it's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it, that shift towards Tammany Hall. I think that um, the emergence of of capital relations and I mean, okay, I mean, just like with Spencer in mind, the formal subsumption of labor under capital, right? Because you have masses of unfree labor in the South and nonetheless are connected to the reproduction of capital in so far as that they're extracting cotton that's gonna be used to fuel the textile manufacturing uh, uh, capital overseas in, in England, in Lancashire and in other places, right? Uh, Manchester, et cetera. So the slaves are fundamentally part of a more global system of capitalism, undoubtedly. So um, the formal subsumption of labor, as Marx called it, um, does generate a massive political crisis, right? And so we have to think that in the 18th century, it's clear, it's clear to us in ways in which the present really occludes that the founding fathers imagined that slavery would come to an end, that this problem would be done away with. And, you know, also Jefferson by the end of his life was actually not so optimistic. He, you know, he was like, I'm not sure what to do with this problem. I think it's going to lead to a conflict, right? Um, the, you know, this is the, the letter that he writes, we have the wolf by the ears, but we don't know what to do with him. We don't know to let him go. Like how, what do we do? Like, what do we do with the, with the slave South? Um, and, in case, uh, uh, sorry, but in, in that case, um, I think that this unprecedented rise of, um, of capital on a global stage, right, so beyond the United States, affects the development of, of, of political, um, of, of politics in the United States. But I think also um, what is emerging, right, is this, this sort of like what to do with the masses, what to do with the public. What to do with the people, the citizens of the United States? How, how are they going to be either part of this, this political like voting um, system? Are they outside of, are they being led, right? What are they being led for? Who, who's, who's in charge? What's, you know, um, what are the ends of this new society that's coming into being? Um, and so in that sense, I think that, you know, my thesis, which is this, this sort of management um, uh, um, necessity that comes into being in the 19th century is what Van Buren is, is recognizing, like astutely sort of recognizing that politics must change, right? So he, he writes all these, um, all these notes about how he recognizes that the old, the old political system cannot stand because people are being pulled into many different directions. And you have to, you have to, you know, he considers himself, um, he, he doesn't consider himself a man of idea so much as somebody who knows men, right? Like the management of people. Um, and, and so a new style of politician, I think, is in part necessitated by this. But I don't want to be so crude about it, meaning I don't want to sort of just say that uh, there exist these kind of uh, exasperations of, 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 of interests and these conflicts in society and bam, there are, there are new politics. Because I think that what's most important is to understand how the legacy of the American Revolution is sort of reinscribed by dealing with these new problems, right? And that's, that's not, um, that outcome is not predetermined. Like how people are interpreting the American Revolution under the new social conditions of the 19th century is not predetermined by the development of these social relations, right? It's this sort of contest that happens in civil society and in the parties. Um, and so I just wanna be careful with how we kind of consider the relationship between the two, because I think in the past, one of the problems that we have to deal with in historiography is that the parties are seen as some kind of expression of interests. And I think that this actually undermines our capacity to understand the political history of America. It's not the case that, you know, Jackson is just a slave owner who's expressing the interests of the planters, or he, he's just a Western frontier man that's expressing the interests of the Westerners, or he's just a, a Northern, a good old man of working people for the working people that's expressing the interests of the, in, the Eastern laborers. 
I think what's critical to understand if the party is how it's able to reconcile all these sort of ideas of what American society ought to be and the promises of the 18th century in the, in the new emerging capitalist order. Um, and so the political history of how the Democratic Party develops is not predetermined in any meaningful way by the emergence of these new social relations. It's a contested, it's a contested issue, like politics is, is a contested um, problem. Yeah, so I think maybe what you're saying is don't don't think about Tammany Hall as inevitable. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a reason why Tammany Hall and the political gangs of, you know, New York, um, etc. are being used by the Jacksonians. I think that there's a kernel of truth in the Whig critique of the mob rule, right, that people can be used, that there's this appearance of giving power to people, but what you do is sort of unleash some of the pathologies of mass society and instrumentalize the pathologies of mass society to maintain uh, a political party in power. Um, and so this, this, you know, this should sort of like ring a bell in the present and how that, how that can happen, how criminal activity, how, um, uh, mass rioting can be presented as sort of an expression of, of a people's power in such a way that it actually maintains the power of, um, of the democratic party. Gotcha. Um, okay. We have another question from Ephraim. Um, you've talked about how this history is taken up by Schlesinger, sorry, still can't say that, in the New Deal era, in the New Deal era or just after, but how is it taken up by the left? Do they follow this New Deal historiography? Do they uphold democracy per se? Do they uphold the nascent labor politics? Um, I mean, I think it's worse. Um, you know, you have kind of like the emphasis of Jackson just as another slaveholder. Um, and maybe that's also like what the New Deal, I mean, sorry, the new left historiography has become in the present, which is sort of like a, a, a caricature actually of the, the new left historiography. So, you know, but it's this move away, if I remember correctly, it's a move away, like Herbert Gutman, who's an inheritor of the new left historiography in the 1970s, it's a move away from politics as such into like social history. Um, and so the idea is that that's where, you know, that's where the real story is um, sort of uh, ground up the, you know, from the bottom up sort of histories and that you can just kind of do away with this, this political history and then this, this new left historiography becomes like much more debased in the present where it's like, well, you can get rid of the white men and you can sort of get the real story of the oppressed people. Um, and so that's part of it, right? Like move away from politics. Um, and I guess now political history is having a kind of return, maybe because the election of Donald Trump threw people into confusion and they're like, oh, politics maybe matter again. Um, but it certainly was the case that the new left is sort of shunned away from political history for a more kind of social history approach. And this may have really confused things. And so again, I just want to clarify, well, while my insistence about um, the sort of transformations of the Jeffersonian tradition outside of the parties is critical, I think, to understanding the emergence of the Republican Party and the new conceptions of free labor, understanding what the Democratic Party is and what did happen between the two parties, between the Whig Party and the Democratic Party, I think is critical to understanding, right, both, both the development of mass politics and the world stage, um, but also um, how the American Revolution becomes sort of problematized and the legacy becomes problematized. Um, but so now I think, I think people do a violence actually to the new leftist historiography. I mean, it's already a problem to think about it this way that you can sort of do away with politics. But now, I mean, the, the caricature of the new left historiography is that you can just do away with the white people or something, right? I mean, I'm being quite crude, but not being far from the truth, um, that you can just not talk about this. You know, you can sort of topple the statues or what may have you and Jackson's legacy will just go away. The irony. Yeah, I feel like this is connected, um, Pam, to your, um, I think it was your cl clarification on the question of like the origins of the labor movement in America during your lecture, because, um, and I, it, it, uh, because I think, you know, what you were saying was that, well, there's, 
pro-labor figures who are anti-abolition, who are anti-abolitionist, and those are like the Jacksonian radicals, and they get mixed up as the origins of the labor movement. Um, but what I think what you're suggesting is rather, you know, no, we have to, there's also these like working men parties who are very anti, who are sort of very pro-abolition, who are the true origins of the labor movement. So it feels like there's also this need to clarify that historiographical point in line with this. Yeah, I mean, this is like a development actually of the 1980s, this wages of whiteness stuff, um, you know, that's, that's making an argument that the problem, you know, why, why the working men elect um, Reagan, uh, right? Like, why is it that the working men elect the, the, the right winger that's against their own interests? It's because he's white. And so there are historians that just write about the period of Jacksonian America that say here you can see these pro-labor leaders they were against the abolitionists right and therefore um, they're sort of bound with the workers on the basis of whiteness um, but uh, and, and there's this inheritance in in the United States and you can see by the voting population that backs Reagan as if the emergence of Ronald Reagan was a problem of, of, of racial affinities um, there's a lot more to say about that but yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it does, it does a real violence to the history, you know, for example, like these are the people that say, oh, when working men in the East, when working men parties, when they say that um, uh, wage labor is a form of slavery, here, here they are, you know, just trying to silence the critiques of Southern slavery, and that's, that's far from the truth. Um, you know, uh, this notion of, of slavery also has this kind of Republican tradition, right, like tyranny and slavery. It's not, um, you know, certainly when working people are denouncing wage labor as a form of slavery as such, there's problems with this conception, but the problems are not racial. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I think we have, okay, we have one more question. Okay, did, did, the, did the workers' associations or the utopian socialists have any political aspirations? Might the absence or unclarity of political aims by American worker parties partly explain the proto-Bonapartist character of Jackson's executive mass democracy? And I believe that's Clint's question or somebody wrote that to Clint. So Clint, if you wanna clarify or I guess I'm just curious um, because on the one hand you characterized um, so that both uh, Hamilton and Jefferson's uh, vision is contradicted by the by the emergence of industrial capitalism, um, and on the other hand that Jackson's Democratic Party, which is not partially like a response to this, um, is 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 proto Bonapartist, and we don't get full fledged Bonapartism until Lincoln. Um, and so I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, how can we be seeing this in, from this like uh, free labor based um, his perspective, um, where you're already starting to see this formulation of a form of social tyranny um, in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And so I'm just curious, like, what sorts of political aims, or you know, was that was there political aims behind these workers' associations, um, or did it stay mostly at the social, like, cooperative, cooperative level? Um, like, do, like, do we only get political aim to provide the working class in the U.S. with like um, Ira Seward's Lasallianism or like the Socialist Party, like, you know, way after the Civil War? Yeah, there's a lot to say about this. So um, it's just because it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. But um, I mean, the highlights, I guess, would be that these independent parties at um, in these elections, they had these independent candidates. And some of those independent candidates did stay strong and continued their critique of the Jacksonian um, party. And so you have these calls in newspapers and things, you know, you need independent political, you need an independent political party. It doesn't come into fruition. There's like stops and starts. And then some of these people are absorbed in New England um, 
there are these reformer parties that end up calling for um, hard money policies, like uh, doing away with the paper currency, and they consolidate around these new party efforts that Wendell Phillips actually is part of. Um, so there's fits and starts. There's fits and starts of these like independent parties. Um, and what happens, at least in the 1850s, is that there's the National Labor Union, which is, which is a different type of institution. Um, William Silvis famously is in it, and he has a role to play in the first international. Um, and so I think that what's made from the political initiatives of these independent working men parties, at least as far as Ira Stewart is going to learn from them, right? So Ira Stewart kind of receives the lessons of this period. He's already active in the 1840s, but he's much more of a leader of the shorter working men's hours in the 1850s and 60s. What he receives is that the working men are being distracted by these other types of reforms that seems to appeal to them. Land reform is one of them. This hard money reform is another one. And all of them, to him, seem to attach them to these already established politicians that are then going to make overtures to these types of reforms, but not really help these working men gain independence, political independence. And, and then there are people like, um, like the Chartists, like Kluwer that I, that I raised, um, you know, who are making these connections um, across the Atlantic, who are calling for this new day of independence, um, the general strike. And, and that's what inspires L.W. Rickman, who is a utopian socialist, who then is won over to this conception of the um, revolutionary industrial government. I think it's Gorevich and some other historians, but Gorevich especially, that shows how this tendency develops um, throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s into this kind of commonwealth within the commonwealth that you could have like a labor commonwealth within the united states as a kind of inheritor state or something and so this this is a political development within the labor um i don't know if you, it's not really a movement you know within within the labor reformers and within the intellectuals and the labor reformers which include working people they're sort of struggling with this conception of the new the new self-determination of labor within the free republic and, and they have this notion of the labor commonwealth. Um, but, but this is a development that goes through the 50s and 60s and, and the high point of which is um, in the fights in the first international in America that happen in the late 1860s and early 1870s and what's going to become the precursor to the Socialist Party. So these are very early years in the development of these ideas in the period that I was talking about. Okay, um, I think that's I think that's it for our our time is up. Um, thank you so much, Pam, for all of your time, um, your lecture, and fielding all of these questions. Um, and thank you very much to our audience members for joining today. Uh, we're going to reconvene next Friday, two p.m. Eastern time, um, at the same link. Um, and Spencer is going to be talking to us about the Civil War. Um, so, all right. Thank you guys very much. Remember to check out the Platypus Review and the, our podcast, Ship Platypus Says, um, where Pam is actually one of the hosts. And happy 4th of July, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Wente. Oh, yes, happy 4th of July, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.